On 10 July, the center of attention in Korea is the city of Taejeon. North Korean forces have driven 60 miles south of Seoul to a point only 15 miles from Taejeon. Here, United States troops, backed by powerful air and artillery concentrations, have temporarily halted the communist tank drive, but no solid defense line has been formed. Troops of the Republic of South Korea are fighting on the right flank of United States forces. This is the situation in the third week of the Korean War. The main port of entry in Korea for U.S. supplies and reinforcements is the port of Pusan. On 5 July, an LST prepares to unload. The immediate destination of the troops on board is a staging area to which they will be transported in buses. Men and equipment being landed here will be rushed to the fighting front to bolster the thin line that is delaying the Red March on Taejeon. These troops this ammunition and equipment will take part in a delaying action which is designed to slow down the North Koreans to a four mile a day pace during their advance to Taejeon. Most of the equipment and most of the men required to launch a U.S. offensive will have to be landed here in Busan in the months to come. South Korean civilian dock workers help unload ammunition and equipment which is so badly needed at this time. Up at the front, 30 miles north of Taejeon on 7 July, United States infantrymen have been forced to withdraw before North Korean tank columns. U.S. artillerymen direct their fire on the village of Chonan, two or three miles away. Chonan has been overrun by the communists earlier in the day, and until tank and infantry reinforcements can be brought up, the job of these artillerymen is to fight a rear guard action. Their routine is to dig in, fire, withdraw dig in and fire again on practically an around-the-clock schedule. On 8 July, with the United States defense line well south of Chonan, some of the first United States tanks to reach Korea head toward the front. By 9 July, captured Russian equipment is increasingly in evidence. Russian scout cars, Russian motorcycles, this materiel was captured in the vicinity of Chochi Wan, 20 miles from Taejeon. Weapons of unusual design are also examined with interest by American Army personnel. The North Koreans are presently using these Russian-made guns in the field. These are Russian-made tanks knocked out on 9 July, testimony to the excellent equipment the North Koreans have. During these first weeks of the Korean War, the North Koreans' tanks advanced practically without opposition. On 14 July, the Taejeon airstrip is still in American hands, and U.S. wounded are brought here to be flown to Japan in hospital planes. These wounded are mostly casualties of the temporary stand being made at the Kum River near Taejeon. Large red crosses, normally identifying ambulances, have been obliterated as much as possible. Even tar has been used to cover them. The North Koreans make targets of clearly marked ambulances. Aboard these planes are nurses who will accompany the wounded on the trip back to the base hospitals in Japan. Some of the more severely wounded receive plasma and other necessary treatment during the trip. On 18 July, 5,000 troops of the United States 1st Cavalry Division land on the east coast of Korea in a full-fledged amphibious movement. They land in one day on the beaches and docks near the port of Pohang. The U.S. Army and Navy collaborate in one of the quickest and most efficient large-scale amphibious operations in history. Although the main communist forces are only 30 miles north of here, this landing is unopposed.
the Hell for Leather Cavalry Division doesn't even get its feet wet. The object for this move in the Korean battle of the build-up is twofold. To get more United Nations troops into Korea as quickly as possible without overloading the already congested facilities at the port of Busan and to strengthen the northern line held by the battle-weary 24th Division and the South Korean Army. And time is precious. To the west, the main U.S. forces have just withdrawn from Taejeon. As the 1st Cavalry Division moves inland, its commanding general, Major General Hobart R. Gay, holds a conference at the command post of the 8th Cavalry Regiment. This conference includes Brigadier General Barnard Wilson, Assistant Commanding General of the 25th Division, Brigadier General Charles Palmer, Commanding General of Division Artillery, and Colonel Ray D. Palmer, Commanding Officer of the 8th Cavalry Regiment. Shortly after hitting the beach, General Gay said, our job is to kill North Korean troops until the United Nations has won a victory in Korea. In the port city of Pohang, South Korean townspeople, who remain off the streets, have erected a sign of welcome. Plodding through a dusty village in a far-off land is no new experience to the 1st Cavalrymen. In World War II, they operated as dismounted and motorized troops in the Admiralty and Leyte campaigns and spearheaded the return to Manila. They are now a full-fledged infantry outfit. They lose no time heading towards the enemy. These scenes are photographed by gun cameras of the attacking Navy planes. They show some of the damage inflicted on North Korean targets in this carrier strike. Most of the missiles seen are rockets and tracers. These attacking planes of the carrier Valley Forge are operated in conjunction with other units of the 7th Fleet, which left their normal duties of protecting Formosa to give air cover to the amphibious landing of the 1st Cavalry Division at Pohan. Nineteen July, aboard the U.S. aircraft carrier Valley Forge. jet lands in the sea on takeoff. If you look in the water to the left of the plane, you can see the pilot. A helicopter is summoned to do an air-sea rescue job right beside the carrier. The pilot seems unhurt, suffering only submersion and shock. Navy personnel bundle him up and take him to sickbay. These scenes are photographed by gun cameras of the attacking Navy planes. They show some of the damage inflicted on North Korean targets in this carrier strike. Most of the missiles seen are rockets and tracers. These attacking planes of the carrier Valley Forge are operated in conjunction with other units of the 7th Fleet, which left their normal duties of protecting Formosa to give air cover to the amphibious landing of the 1st Cavalry Division at Pohang. After this landing, made yesterday, these planes are now ranging far and wide over North Korean territory. The strike over, the planes return to their floating bases. One of the returning fighter planes seems to have disabled its landing gear during the strike. Firefighting crews and medical corps men race toward the plane to make sure it doesn't catch fire and that the pilot is safe. The pilot climbs out of the cockpit under his own power and the deck is cleared for another plane to land. As one plane lands, its rockets are jarred loose. Crewmen rush to retrieve them and throw them overboard. 
Actually, there is little danger of these rockets exploding as they are electrically detonated and the connection was broken when they were jarred loose from the plane. But it's played safe. A scoreboard on the Valley Forge totals up the knockouts in today's strike. Edge on 19 July. This city is the head of the highway and the railroad that leads to the last American base, Busan, 125 miles away. As American reinforcements speed toward Tejan, the battle begins, and on 20 July, destruction comes to this city, which has a population of 37,000. U.S. forces defending Tejan are the strongest yet sent into battle in Korea. This battle is a major test. But U.S. forces in Tejun face tank columns followed by masses of infantry. By overwhelming numerical superiority, the North Koreans breach the perimeter defenses and surge into the town. The Tejun battle begins and ends in one day. Street fighting breaks out everywhere as the communists enter Tejun. Unknown to many of these troops, the enemy is rapidly surrounding the city to a depth of three miles. When the order to withdraw comes, these men will have to fight their way out as Tejon falls to the communists. But once more, precious time is being gained in the U.S. strategy of delaying action. Twenty-one July, near Hamchang, 50 miles northeast of Tejon, we see some of the first U.S. tanks in action. This is in the vicinity of a village called Sangyong Dok Dong. Tanks are working their way to a position on a hillside north of the village to prepare for a possible enemy breakthrough. All along this northern line near Hamchang, the Reds have increased their pressure considerably since the fall of Tejun. There is a slight lull around Tejun as the Reds regroup their forces. In this area, there is evidence that a strong attack can be expected very soon. On this date, General Douglas MacArthur stated, quote, we are prepared to cede positions with low defensive potential for positions that can be held with forces currently available and which can ultimately act as a springboard for United Nations offensives. Twenty two July, Songju, Korea, ten miles south of Hamchang. 25th Division engineers are laying a rock foundation on the bottom of a stream to aid vehicles in crossing. This stream has become swollen by a recent rain. The underwater bridge will not be strong enough to support heavy vehicles, but jeeps will be able to cross safely. July and August are the months of the rainy season in Korea, and at this time a small stream can become a river overnight. On this date, the Reds have pushed on through Hamchang and are now engaged in a drive toward this area. Twenty-four July on the Northern Front, a 25th Division heavy mortar company fires at the enemy. A gun crew fires a 105 millimeter howitzer. On 25 July, the red drive in the southwest gets underway, but in the central sector, U.S. troops hold fast. Here, infantry watch United States planes strafing the enemy in the nearby hills. On 25 July, the North Koreans appear near Yongdong, 
25 miles east of Tejan. Sniper fire grows heavy. U.S. troops cover a bridge with rifle and machine gun fire to help the last units cross a river. At this time, the North Koreans hold a section of Yongdong, which American soldiers set fire to the day before. Some miles north, beyond this river, red tanks are moving in this direction along the Tejon yongdong Highway. It is a tense time here. A jeep of the 8th Cavalry Regiment races over the bridge, its passengers firing as they go. On 27 July, in Chinju, in the southern sector, a United Nations flag flies over a 24th Division regimental command post. North Korean captives are brought to this command post for interrogation. It is said that an experienced observer can tell what section of Korea these men come from by examining their feet. At the end of July, the North Koreans have lost an estimated 31,000 men. Up on the northern front on 29 July, South Korean soldiers make extensive use of natural camouflage. They are moving anti-tank guns to an orchard overlooking a road. Concerning these South Korean troops, General MacArthur said after a visit to the front that he was highly pleased with the offensive spirit being shown by the South Koreans after their initial reverses. Another tense moment in the work of the infantrymen in Korea. This is the first week of August. These men are moving out to recover tanks and armored vehicles left on this mountainous road near the front. There is occasional enemy fire, and the troops advance carefully. They approach dead enemy soldiers cautiously, alert to tricks of concealed North Koreans. Enfilading fire slows down the advance on this road, where a fierce battle took place a short while before. Knowing they haven't much time, the infantrymen push forward before this area falls into enemy hands. The North Koreans hold the high ground covering this road as the men rush up and recover the vehicles. A familiar scene to veterans of World War II. B-29 Super Fortresses in Okinawa are being prepared for bombing missions on communist-held positions in Korea. These aircraft of the 19th Bomb Group are being primed for strikes on Hung Nam in the north and on Seoul, main artery of communication for the North Korean forces. This is the pilot's view of an air attack on North Korean positions during the week of 26 July. These scenes were filmed by a U.S. Air Force gun camera in an F-80 jet plane. Familiar scene to veterans of World War II. B-29 Super Fortresses in Okinawa are being prepared for bombing missions on communist-held positions in Korea. These aircraft of the 19th Bomb Group are being primed for strikes on Hung Nam in the north and on Seoul, main artery of communication for the North Korean forces. Bombs are prepared and rolled into position under the Super Fort. There, the bombs are swallowed up in the Bombay bellies of the planes. Loading and preparing the aircraft is completed while the flight crews receive last-minute instructions. When briefing is complete, the planes are ready to take off. As these B-29s fly to Korea, UN ground troops are attacking in the southern sector where the North Koreans are massing for an offensive. The raids of these superforts on Hung Nam and Seoul are planned to help cripple the long supply lines that run to the communist positions in the south.
over the target, it's bombs away. Seventy-two tons of explosives on the Reds' vital railroads. At an advanced fighter base in southern Japan on 4 August, F-80 jets are readied for a mission against the North Koreans. The cameraman who filmed these scenes is also going along in one of the planes on this mission, and you will see this air attack from the cockpit. These are oversized fuel tanks, developed to keep the plane over the target longer. This fighter plane outfit has been in action since the start of the Korean War. Most of these pilots have flown 30 missions. A few have already flown 40 missions. Most of the following footage is taken from the rear cockpit through the plexiglass canopy of a T-33 jet plane. The ghost image you see is the reflection in the plexiglass. On the ground at this time, the Reds have advanced 75 miles from Tejan, and the Battle of the Naktong River is in full force. The battle for the Pusan beachhead is beginning, the decisive battle of the war. This is the sixth week of the war, and part of the increasing fury you will see expressed in the threat of these Air Force planes as they zoom over the enemy territory. As more and more men and weapons move in against the communists on the ground, more and more warplanes fill the air above them. This is typical Korean scenery. Wide, shallow rivers, rice fields in the flatlands, rolling hills on the horizon. Much of the fighting in Korea has been along the roads. These roads have aided the North Korean tanks considerably. The chief obstacle to tanks in Korea has been the rivers, but even when bridges are blown, the communists ferry tanks across, usually at night, to prevent detection by the U.S. Air Force. Mission completed, the jets peel off and head for home. Three August, the first provisional marine brigade lands in Korea at the port of Busan. These marines have been rushed to Korea from California. Modern U.S. tanks are a growing answer to the Russian T-34 tanks, which gave the North Koreans such an initial advantage. A marine tank battalion moves up a street through Busan. These marines are expected to equalize by skill and firepower the North Koreans' numerical superiority. Fifth Ordnance Company, Tegu, 4 August. M24 tanks arriving from Busan. The day is past when South Korean defenders had virtually no tanks and only relatively light artillery. Heavy tanks and artillery have increased in quantity and U.S. arms of every description are rapidly equalizing such weapons as these which were captured from the North Koreans. These arms gave the North Koreans a great initial advantage, not because of superior quality, but because they were available in quantity for use by a great numerical superiority of troops. As U.S. weapons arrive in quantity in Korea, the myth of superior communist arms is rapidly being silenced. 